Chris, why don't we just just pick up for a second where you just were there? Um, so it, it was clear, I think, how using AI can help with coding. But I uh, I went from ten to twenty students teaching writing. Yeah. And uh, that was a lot, and because it's constant feedback. So are you looking at ways to for AI to give feedback across the board, or is it only in certain dis disciplines? To give you an idea of what's the good, great question, thank yeah. you very much. Uh, to give you an idea of what's the frontier of what we think we can do is we did take a data set which had open-ended written answers. Uh, the citizenship test of the U.S. There's questions that they'll ask you like, why did the original pilgrims come to America? And then if you want to become an American citizen, you write a sentence saying why you think that's the answer. For that level of complexity, we could grade better than the U.S. government. But you know, at the complexity of an essay, all those promises go out the window. You know, that sort of level of complexity or creativity, AI hasn't gotten even close to approaching. Uh, that's where I would draw the line. Well, you see even companies like Facebook who are now bringing in human moderators because the AI is not good enough to detect things like hate speech and violations of their yeah. norms. But I think here at Stanford, for those of you who don't know, we do have the computational journalism lab in the Department of Communication that is looking at building tools to actually write stories. I remain on the skeptical side, but it seems yeah. if I want to export what I teach in journalism to the world, the big problem is feedback. Yeah. I can't give the kind of feedback I give in class. Yes, Dan. So the, the game where they're making the posters, there's an AI system behind evaluating their posters. And what we've done is we said, we're not going to evaluate their creativity. That's too hard. Mm -hmm. There's 21 features that a good graphic design has. And it, it can evaluate that. So I think if you lower the bar for what it is you want to provide mm -hmm. feedback on, mm -hmm. where it's more rule-based, you could do it. Yeah. Okay, I want to talk about doing that then. That's yeah, one, one brief yeah, thing. It's, it's yeah, just that, you know, some that. of the AI that, that we're working on isn't like just trying to make AI in some ways creative itself. Uh -huh. um, not that it's necessarily requisite for giving good feedback like this, but I think that we're really just scratching the surface on, on that. So in other words, you're all predicting that we will get there, where we can give enough feedback for sort of longer form, other kinds, I mean, even on the art example, for example. Yeah. Like, is there AI feedback to be done in a paint, an online painting MOOC? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So certainly, you know, and the beautiful work being done in outlier detection, understanding the difference between something that's creative in an interesting curios curiosity way and maybe creative in a way that might show you don't understand underlying concepts. There's, can I just throw out a word of caution, though? Yeah. There's a lot of reason to believe that when we get to the level of essays, there's going to be incredible issues. I think somebody at Stanford is doing an analysis of the entrance exams to the UC system. And you know, if you have an AI algorithm look at that, sure, it might give you some response, but it encodes bias in its understanding of language um, and bias in its understanding from what it's been trained on for that discriminates people based on social economic status. So words of caution before we get there. All right, but, take that but it's going to be pretty good in rule-based domains, like grammar, yeah. spelling. Yeah. Right. It's, uh, so if you, if, if you set your sites lower, AI is going to be a big win. Yeah, and maybe that will help the teachers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so Dan, um, for me, the, the, the key word I'm going to remember from your talk is amenable. Like you kept saying this word amenable. So will they, the students, use design thinking um, in amenable situations and will it help them learn? So can you just talk about what are the situations that are not amenable that, that advocates of this kind of change are really pushing? Like where, should, where would you say, no, don't do it in this subject matter area, do it here? So two, two parts to that question maybe. One is could we teach all curriculum through design? And so the answer may be yes. I don't know. I doubt mm -hmm. it. But the answer may be yes. The other is, boy, there's a whole kind of set of instructions or tasks that you do where the environmental constraints are such that design is a bad choice. Mm -hmm. uh, you're given a uh, spelling mm -hmm. test you know, to study for it. I'm not sure design's the best way. Probably better to just memorize. Mm -hmm. OK, so again, so, to, so we don't want to force it in certain areas where it doesn't make sense, like a spelling test. So are there like three where we should be doing it? And three, we, I mean, in your mind, like in terms of history or science or you know, I mean, where it's like, no, you don't want to do that with, with that subject area. So it's going to depend how clever you are. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's hard to have a main statement. So one of the units that we had for the teaching design thinking was the students had to design a system for making fair decisions. Uh, and this was really good because they'd been studying governments across history, mm -hmm. you know, authoritarian governments. And so they had a chance to design, and then they could see how these different systems worked out. So that was really a good space for it. But I could have taught it a different way, and design might not have worked so well. Yeah. So, so it's hard to say there's a main effect. 
and I want to uh, get to Nick, but just one thing I wanted to clarify. When you were showing, you gave, um, you did it in parallel. You did two things in parallel, or you sought feedback, right? Those two different conditions, right? You said try parallel. Yeah, you. Sorry, Dan, for you first. What, which, <laughs> sorry, I was, I was, confused, I was busy I'm, looking at the random motion. Out I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure the audience understood, but right, okay. I'm just a simple communication lecturer. So. <laughs> which was the which was the winning one? Which was the one that was better in those conditions, like for proving that design thinking was good or bad? They they tied. They, they both, tied. They, they both tied. they both helped uh, the respective move in design. Is is seeking constructive criticism better than trying multiple that's options? That's what I wasn't sure. Yeah, yeah that's sort of a, a strange juxtaposition because I'd want people to do both. Do both is the takeaway. Yeah, yeah. They but both they, work. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. I didn't understand. They're both good. Do both. <laughs> <laughs> and Nick, again, because lowly calm lecturer, um, when you were look, when the you said the autist, the the person with autism spectrum disorder, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as they moved up the autism spectrum, they looked less at the animate one. Yeah. So the yeah. your main takeaway there was what exactly? Well, I think that that sort of, I mean, I think what one main takeaway from that is that like that's a low sample size, and we're doing a lot of follow up work to better to better understand um, that process. I think. Um, you know, one takeaway is that is that, that is sort of uh, um, replicating in some way um, something that we have some understanding of at various levels on, in the um, study of autism, which is there is there are differences in facial attention, um, in particular less, um, um, in particular early in life. Um, uh, but I think I think that like a, a real takeaway from that is to really be able to um, leverage that sort of data. We 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 really need pretty precise models that that can. Can help you analyze uh, the sort of time series that I that I was um, displaying at, at the end there. Not not only is it that they look at um, faces less, but there's these very different strategies that they employ when they're trying to understand these sorts of scenes. And if we understand these strategies, then then we can hope to understand their learning a bit better. I mean, across the board, it seems like what you're all suggesting on some level is how can technology help different kinds of learners or so people who, you know, more adept at code naturally or not, you know, can we do interventions technologically to help them here, obviously, with the autism and also with the design thinking. Maybe there's people who would prefer one of those two options, right? I mean, is that, are we actually expanding with all of these solutions you're proposing the, the breadth of how we can teach so we can actually teach individually in different ways? Is that sort of a common theme I'm hearing or not really? Yeah, certainly. Mm -hmm. I mean, one, one thing I would, you know, if I gave the 12 minute version of this talk for the yeah. 10 minute, I would probably introduce this framework that I believe in deeply, which is we look at someone's past to understand them. We can use something like feedback just as a way to articulate our understanding. But really, if we're developing student understanding, that's just a platform from which we can innovate. Like, if we understand our students, how are we going to then use that to help them? So I, I, uh, let, let me try a different version of what you said. So some people want personalized yeah. learning so that for each child, they get something different depending on their learning styles mm -hmm. or tastes, things like that. I prefer to think of it as learner-centered. You start from where the learner is, and you kind of deliver content to where they are, as opposed to saying they're a type of person, mm -hmm. right, which, which runs into trouble. Right away, because the so if you just say learner centered, you're trying to understand the learner to design the system. So that's what Nick's doing. That's what I'm doing. That's what Chris is doing. We're trying to understand the learner so we can design. Now, the, it could be that all all million five hundred thousand learners are identical, mm -hmm. right? And you give them the same thing, but we still want to understand the learner so we can give them the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. But is that per but why isn't that personalizing it then to it, that particular person, offering them sort of a way? Because everybody's the same. Mm -hmm. That million, one million five hundred thousand people are otherwise the same. No, I'm thinking about it from the perspective. Of, I'm married to an HCI guy who studies virtual reality, Jeremy Balenson, and and he's you know talks about putting everybody in a virtual classroom, and then you have the very best instructor, but that person can look in the eyes of each student, right? The virtual teacher, right? Or if a person learns in a certain way, you can maybe offer a different kind of teacher. Now that's a different kind of thing, but it's sort of related here, isn't it? Right? I mean, you're saying understand how they learn. Walk me through this one more time so that they. You, you, you want to understand what they know and do. Okay. And then you want to design your instruction around them. As opposed to saying, I'm going to make a MOOC that delivers college level lectures to everybody in the world. But so, say in the class of 30, you have kids who are, do, they're going to yeah, so, do differently. So, in that case, I might personalize. 
You might. Okay, that's what yeah. I'm saying. But but yeah. you don't have to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A couple of interesting things. I think I think in particular when you're when you're um, studying uh, autism spectrum, I mean, there's been uh, and continues to be a very important move away from <laughs> thinking of it necessarily as treating a disorder to understanding differences in how they and, and how different people learn that those can be quite diverse and that you should perhaps handle those all mm -hmm. um, quite differently. I mean, so, and so that's, I mean, yes, it, it, it again comes down to like trying to understand the learner and, and the diversity of, of learning that, that occurs. Um, and I do think that um, trying, to, trying to personalize these sorts of tools is, is, is incredibly important for this. Um, we, we, we actually made a go of that to some extent in the uh, Autism Glass project. Mm -hmm. um, there were some very considerable human-computer interaction challenges with that. Mm -hmm. I, should, I guess that's the only thing to say with that. Mm -hmm. and, and so there's a lot more work to, to be done to, I think, begin to, to do something like that in that, in that context. But um, they, uh, something that I think is very important. So let, let, me, let me push back on personalization a little more. Okay. Uh, if you if you take if you take this to the end game, the computer is making all the decisions for what the student should do. So basically, the computer is programming the child mm -hmm. based on its belief about what that personal child, mm -hmm. that individual needs on all these variables. Suddenly, the student's just not doing human stuff anymore. Mm -hmm. They're just a machine you're programming. If you over personalize, you want to put them in a situation where they have to make some decisions about right. their own learning. Choice, is that choice. I was going to say something that I thought was going to be a hot take, but actually after that it's going to sound <laughs> but, um, Just through this evolution, I really have come to the point of thinking not just of the student as the person who is getting, you know, the recipient, but as the teacher being the person for whom we are developing these tools. If we understand the teachers, or sorry, the students, can we give that information to the teachers? Because then they give the human side to the learning. You guys can tell me about this better than I can, but as a teacher, I do believe motivation and identity matter so much that clarity of instruction can almost seem secondary. Uh, and a good teacher who seems to really understand you maybe can motivate you. And perhaps the way that AI is going to make its biz biggest impact is through that human intervention. Good job, Chris. <laughs> is that, I, that is theory, right? hot take. I think it counts, counts as a hot take. And, and let me just say, yeah. I, I think that, I, I think that like, uh, um, you know, when I said that in the Glass project we had very significant human-computer interaction challenges in trying to personalize mm -hmm. it, well, I do think that it potentially could be done the right way. Yeah, it's exactly these things that, that, they're, that they're identifying that, that are, are uh, you know, what you should really think about. There's a system of, like, child, device, family. They're all manipulating each other in some way. And, and um, if you do it naively, it, it goes quite poorly. All right, a couple questions coming in. I think Elizabeth's collecting a couple cards, if, if anybody has some questions. Just a quick clarification here, question for Nick. Um, are the glasses suitable for all ages? Uh, great question. Um, uh, and I should have said that, right, the, the, um, we, we tried them on ages um, 4 to 15 and saw um, some interesting effects ac across the board. Though, um, I guess, precisely what I... Um, was was uh, quoting when I when I talked about those those results um, was was in the age of like uh, five to ten so so that um, that's an, uh, the age window in which we really were refining that but I think there are interesting things to be said about about broader ages um, though I think it, it's maybe less so past fifteen. Okay, Chris, for feedback generation, what type of ontology would be needed? Is that practical right now? For actually turning, uh, I. That's a good question. Uh, the ontology gets a little bit messy once you work in the world of the complexity of, say, language. Like if we're trying to give feedback on a sentence, um, on some level, ontology gets complicated because you have the generative structure of a sentence goes way beyond discrete decisions. Um, having said that, the Josh Tenenbaum inspired models we have involve a teacher in the loop. And when the teacher's in the loop, they are giving us language. Uh, and so maybe that answers the ontology question. And when the teacher's in the loop, they're saying, I'm thinking about the structure in which a student would make decisions in this problem. Uh, and they give names to that structure. So that's the sort of language we use to give information back from the system. So uh, it get, comes from the teacher, I suppose. OK, Dan, uh, do the lower performing students try fewer alternatives and seek praise over critique because they lack confidence? Uh, yeah, so I, I could imagine they would seek praise, um, you know, because they've had a life of being criticized. Who wants more? 
doesn't really work very well for why lack of confidence would stop me from trying lots of stuff, mm -hmm. right? The other thing to remember is uh, they're uncorrelated. Mm -hmm. So lack of confidence can explain why uh, some choose positive reinforcement instead of criticism and singular answers, right? right? They're not correlated. So there's not going to be a single construct to explain both. Mm -hmm. Is there a Is way it? just sort of low tech, just through the teacher to encourage people to seek out yeah, that well, that's, that's what our instruction that's, was. Yeah. yeah, to like yeah. just verbally yeah. tell them this is why this is a benefit. To well, so the way we yeah. tell them yeah. was they say, this is what you, you should seek constructive criticism. You're not going to want to because it hurts. Right. And so I'm a tough love kind of guy. Yeah. So I say, it's going to hurt, but you'll get over it and it'll be better. Yeah. Other people would say, it'll hurt, but fail early, fail off. And great experts always did this. I just tell them to get over it. Get over it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So they, I, I want to tell them, don't do early closure. <laughs> Early closure is a really easy, nice phrase. Did yeah. you patent? Is that a patent phrase? Don't steal it. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. How to assess programs that develop creativity? That seems like a really apt question for this day. Yeah. So I, right. I, Martha, I, did you write that one? No. no I'm, I'm endorsing You love so, this one, right? So this is a mistake. Uh, mm. It's not a mistake. You don't want to. So creativity depends on some luck. And so if you try and measure it directly, mm. the, the person may have had a lucky or unlucky day. What you want to measure are the strategies. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot, we, we, I can just enumerate a bunch of strategies to increase creativity. Take a walk, design in parallel, right? Mm -hmm. These are sketch, these all increase your chances of being creative. So measure whether they use the strategies. Mm -hmm. That's the best way to do it. Don't, don't measure it whether they It seems like such an important distinction. I think so. No, but are people recognizing that? I, I do. <laughs> I mean, for the audience, I mean, Roy's here, I mean, others, I mean, are there, is that, I mean, because people are so focused on the creativity is such a buzzword right it's a, now. Everybody right? thinks it's a trait. Everybody it's thinks a it's trait. a trait. So and you it's may just, not be able to teach it at all. It's a bunch of strategies. Mm. It's a bunch of strategies. You guys yeah. want to comment on this at all or weigh in or? No? I'm very excited about the problem of algorithmically understanding the difference between creativity and not creativity. There's a beautiful math problem underneath the hood there, and uh, we're getting deep into it. That will not tell people how to be creative, but it'll definitely scratch a niche for us. Okay, so here, how important do you think it will be to make your algorithms recommending particular learner behaviors comprehensible to learners and teachers? Why or why not? I don't know who wants to take that one. I'm going to say incredibly yeah. important. Actually, that's you know one of the crucial desiderata is that it has to be interpretable. And as I've said maybe a few times now, I think particularly by teachers because mm -hmm. uh, you know if you're teaching a class of 40 students, you want to be able to quickly under identify exactly who is where, who's stuck on what. Maybe these four students are on the same problem. Uh, so you put it in a language that teachers understand, and you've done something worthwhile. All right, we have time for about two more here that came in. This seems. Uh, We've covered this a little bit, but it's an interesting question. What can AI do to motivate the student? Please share some of the latest developments. Seems like with your games that there was built-in motivation happening there as well, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, I don't, I don't know that the AI was yeah. doing it. They were just clever games. They were clever. But yeah. is, there, is there an area, is this something that people are looking into using AI on the motivation? Or? So it's going to be really easy to use it. If your source of motivation is a reward, Mm -hmm. AI is going to be really good. Those casinos are going to have it. They're going to find the whale, and they're going to be able to pick the person out to find out what kind of reward they like the most to keep them playing. Mm -hmm. well, this if is it, happening it's, in the game world right now, right? Duolingo the whole addictiveness What's that? Duolingo. Yeah. yeah. I'm stuck yeah. on this yeah. app. Yeah. Yeah. I've learned Italian. So, so yeah. there, that's easy. Social motivation yeah. might be harder. You know, mm -hmm. those, are di those are different kinds of motivations. Mm -hmm. but for rewards, it's easy. This kind of, uh, my basic understanding is that if you peel back the layer behind motivation, you find identity in how people see themselves. Like, do you see yourself as somebody in programming who could be a programmer? Or do you see this as part of your future reward in your own life? And how somebody sees themselves seems like a very hard thing to operationalize. Uh, and maybe when you talk about computers programming us, uh, something that maybe I don't want them programming. Yeah. Wait, Chris, so, what are you saying? How does that relate? Was that an important question to answer before? You know, as your yeah. as as the, everybody goes into CS one hundred six A, they're terrified. Yeah, yeah. Right. So are you saying get to the bottom of how they see themselves first? Uh, yeah, and this is okay. Mm -hmm. I can't take off my hat as yeah, an AI researcher and just put yeah. on my teacher hat. Yeah. yeah. If somebody comes to my class, and I'm not like, how is the AI going to keep you in my class? I yeah. ask my question <laughs> deeply to myself. How can I convince these people that this is part of the modern yeah. world? It's going to be part of their future. 
that they are welcome in my class. And there's lots of strategies for that. I tell stories that I think are relevant to them. I, I give them examples that have social implications because that resonates with a lot of human beings. <laughs> uh, and it has nothing to do with AI. OK, sorry, Dan. Go ahead. Yeah. No, no. I, 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 I agree. I mean, I, I look at students. And the thing to remember is there's a lot of different things that motivate. And they really have different profiles. So reinforcement, you know, that works for your dog. It works for humans, too. You give them. But belonging, that's a very different kind of motivator, and you want to address it differently. And uh, so, so it sounds like so a lot of the motivation needs to be human still, not only AI. We can't outsource that completely to AI. I don't know. All you, right. you know, you get in VR, and I see other people programming. It turns out they all look like me, and now I'm motivated to be a programmer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice <laughs> journey. Nice journey later. Okay. Yeah. All right. I think there's time. For, did you want to ask oh, me? Just, just yeah, one, sorry. One, one quick kind of sort of different take on that is I think that, yeah. like, you know, one, one thing that we had, pay, had to pay very careful attention to in designing um, a, a device like the, the, the Glass Project is, you know, perhaps it's a hypothesis for, for, how it's, for how something like this helps is, that, like, in subtle ways, doing things like this can motivate people to explore social situations early in life that, um, that can, can lead to these sorts of skill building. And I think that, um, it, that that's certainly a big piece of it. Like, right, you, could, you can use technologies to, make, to give um, subtle cues. Um, just the fact that right, I, I described the, like the green box that, that lights up when, when a face is in front of you. Well, you know, it's not a really strong uh, motivator necessarily, but maybe that's, maybe that's enough to do something interesting. I mean, Nick, it just sounds so urgent, what you're doing, I got to say. I mean, seriously. I mean, it's a, such an, I mean, as a non-tech person, it just seems like the application, this actual real application, an AR application that makes sense and is really pro-social. I mean, I hope it will, hope you, wish you luck. Okay. okay. Last question. So this is sort of, I guess, like sort of a warning about how do we avoid stifling creativity. If we build out frameworks and pathways on how students should think, would that stifle their creativity? And how do we balance the rule-centric AI setting against room for free thinking? Like sort of maybe a, someone who's a bit concerned about some of this, maybe. Stifling, yeah. Okay, Chris. Uh, I guess that was our motivation. I feel like one of the answers is the more superficial our AI, the more superficial the assignments that they can understand, the more there'll be motivations on students, uh, teachers to help people not do creative tasks, do things like simple yes or no answers or things that you can easily recognize as correct or incorrect. One of my hopes is that as these automatic understanding systems become more sophisticated, mm -hmm. then we can enable teachers to feel comfortable being like, go program something awesome and we'll re figure out what you know. Um, we'll do that hard work ourselves. It's a bit of the dream. Mm. Any final thoughts from two of you? Stif you're not worried about stifling creativity. I don't my, think. my whole study was to get kids to get a bunch of strategies to be creative. Yeah. yeah. I'm so not, you're not worried. Uh, I'm maybe. worried that other people may screw it up, yes. <laughs> what happens? <laughs> but Dan, what happens if everybody doesn't see your slideshow and then and they, don't, they don't do it? And they'll, they go make, on. they'll make the mistake that they believe what it means to do well in school is to follow a set of procedures. Uh, All right. Well, uh, and do well on a test. It's procedural base. Well, uh, I have to think of something positive to say to wrap us up. So let's hope that that's not the case. And uh, <laughs> please join me in thanking Thank our panelists. <laughs>